after the training. Um, for those who may have something they want to do, like a project, you are going to write um, a proposal to apply for the impact fund. So um, for the certificate and the impact fund, if you want to apply for any of them, or if you want to get any of them, you have to make sure that uh, you must have an 80% attendance before you be qualified to get the certificate. I understand that somebody asked yesterday how we are going to do that because there was no attendance um, form that was shared. But what we do is that um, we normally provide a form at the end of the training because um, we believe that if we're going to be leaders, one of the first things that you have to imbibe is in the spirit of honesty. You have to be honest. So we do provide you with that form and you are going to fill and um, state the number of days that you attended the training. And from there, we're going to look at it and also cross check from our recordings and see if you are eligible for the certificate. And for the impact fund, and Uncle Sop has already spoken on that. So you must be here on the last day to learn about how to apply for that. And I also mentioned that we have an AC competition that is currently ongoing. So if you are a student, you can take note of that. So right away, I'm going to be introducing our speaker for today. And she's going to be speaking on the essence of building resilient capacity as a 21st century leader. So our speaker is a very special person. Um, her name is uh, uh, Professor Chaya Badwaj. She's an, an Alexander von Humboldt International Climate Protection Fellow, 2024 to 2025, hosted at the Center for Fundamental Rights. During her time at the center, she will be researching climate change, migration, and human rights in South Asia. She's also an associate professor at the OP Jindal Global University, a PhD candidate at Dublin City University, and a member of the World Commission on Environmental Law. So, uh, dear distinguished participants, join me through our emojis, reactions in the chat, as we welcome our distinguished facilitator for the day, Professor Chaya. So, uh, hi, Francis. So you can, Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. All right, great. Um, okay, sorry. Thank you for this uh, elaborative uh, introduction, Francis. Um, and thank you for saying I am a super special person for this uh, presentation here. Uh, I'm going to uh, convey my presentation and lecture in the best possible way I can. Uh, I'm going to be using video tools in order to convey it. Also, um, the idea or understanding of this presentation is to make you understand what are the key skills required to be a resilient leader. Um, and before I continue doing this, um, I, I, want to I, I want to share a story, which is something that I did uh, as a student growing up. And um, because we are, because most of, most of us come from communities uh, of global South countries, there are some challenges that we face uh, commonly, continuously at our uh, in, in our countries, and uh, th this could be a variety of um, challenges uh, which are common. But I think one common challenge that remains is uh, education for those who are uh, the most vulnerable communities um, in our in our societies. Uh, and at some of the other level, uh, most of us have been part of the system there and we try to uh, make sure to do the best uh, so that the most vulnerable can receive education. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, while we are doing this, we definitely uh, look into uh, ways uh, that we can do this. And, and in the process of doing this, I think some of the most common challenges that we face is um, trying to say gather resources to help those people, and and one of those resources is um, money, finances. Where is the money going to come from? While we are trying to bring this change in our community, and so that remains the biggest challenge uh, for most communities um, 
uh, from the global south communities and then apart from that sometimes even if we have money the uh, non indigenous non tribal western very english or very um you know non native way of doing things can also be another challenge to it which means even if we have money uh, in that sense then we don't have the technological capacity or the language capacity to implement the changes that we want to implement and and i and i hear this often that translation of the best practices just the language translation and not, i'm not even talking about translation of a best practice to ground when it comes to really implementing it but just the translation of understanding the best practice from english which is the standard prevalent language to our own native language can be very very challenging and so those are other non financial challenges that most of the communities face and so while we are discussing all of this uh we should keep in mind i'm i'm beginning with this as because i want you to keep in mind that a lot of these challenges for uh leaders of a people who want to make a change or who are continuously trying to do it make a change all of these problems remain common but the idea definitely is to make sure that we need to figure out a way you know to do things that we want to do and it couldn't it shouldn't be at large scale but it can be at the smallest scale with the minimal of resources that we have all right with that in mind uh thinking that i am audible um to you all uh i'm sharing the screen so i want to know if the screen is visible to you all or not if there's anybody who can just give me a thumbs up uh or a raise of hand saying or or a chat message saying it's visible It's visible. I can see it from my end. Okay. All right. Great, great, great. Thanks. Okay. I thought I, I, thought I lost you all, but um, anyway, I am going to share it again. Here we go. Share and share. All right. Great. Now, what is the essence to building resilient capacity for leaders? And before I do that, I want to understand what I want you to understand what resilient capacity means. Is there a word for resilience in your language? Do you know a word for resilience in your language? Okay. Um, uh, if you want to answer the question, you can raise up your hand so that you can just unmute or your mic. Or you can mic just and... type it in the chat box, yeah. yeah. All right, that is great. I mean, it's okay. We can we can talk about it later. Just wanted to uh, know if you knew there were, if there was a word for resilience um, in, in your language. I haven't been able to figure out a word that equates with resilience yet in my own language, in the language that I um, grew up uh, in, that is Hindi, and I still don't know the word for resilience in my own language. Um, however, I mean, there is a word that translates, but I don't think, I don't think there is a word that really captures the essence of what really uh, resilience uh, means. Uh, but if you know um, a word that actually translates to what resilience means, I would be happy to learn it. And so resilient capacity uh, in English, resilience means to be able to continue in the most simplistic of meanings. 
Uh, and resilient capacity means ability to a minimize exposure and sensitivity to shocks and stresses. Let me give you an example. In global South countries, we face a lot of disasters every single day. We face floods, desertification, um, we face shrinking of Lake Chad that is happening. We face shrinking of our coastal lines that is happening because of sea level rise. There's continuous tornado, there's continuous um, uh, earthquakes um, and, and other disasters that keep on happening. There are a lot of industrial disasters as well that happen. And industrial disasters are happening in most global South countries because Number one, industries are set up in our countries or were set up in our countries by Western corporations um, so because they couldn't find approvals, regulatory approvals in their own countries to set up those industries. They move those industries to our countries, which basically have zero or no regulation, uh, but they're able to continue their activities in our countries with least regulation. And because there's least regulation, the disasters are frequently occurring. And so a lot of a lot of communities in the West don't even know what it means to live through disasters. Um, and and not that everyone should live through disasters, but then the understanding of resilience from a Western perspective um, is, is very, very different from what resilience would mean in the, uh, from the perspective of global South countries. And, I, and, and even though it is, a very, it is currently a very new phenomenon and a, and a Western concept, um, it definitely uh, needs more indigenous perspective to what being resilient mean. And so a lot of lot of what I'm talking I'm going to be talking about is going to be um, non-indigenous. Um, and I would be happy to learn if there are any indigenous practices to uh, what I'm saying right now, just just highlighting that. In addition to this, um, I also want to highlight one more thing, which is being resilient uh, or being a leader that has a resilient capacity capabilities would also mean that uh, you need to leave no one behind. And so if you're talking about sustainability or if you're talking about sustainable development goals in, in the sense that uh, we need more sustainability and we need more resilience, then leaving no one behind is also going to be a very essential component of building resilience. How do we do that? How do we really um, make sure that we are building, we, are, we have resilient capacity as a leader? Number one, we take preventative measures. Preventative measures to protect ourselves and to protect our community from exposure and sensitivity to shocks and stresses. Now, preventative measures are very common when it comes to sustainability, right? Um, I, I don't know if there are people uh, on this call who say um, drive um, or who ride bicycles or who ride bikes. Are there people on this call who do that? or who love to do that? And so if you're somebody who drives a car or if you're somebody who um, rides a bike, you take certain preventative measures in your in your daily life as well, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about the micro level uh, preventative measures but from a very general perspective, there are general preventative measures that we all take in our life. Um, and so if you drive, you definitely wear a seatbelt, regardless of which global South country you're coming from. 
uh, a lot of global south countries are going to be like i ah, just seed belt don't even care about it um who drives with a seed belt right um but you definitely need to take those precautionary preventative measures if you are a leader who wants to build in resilient uh, sustainability resilient capacity uh, for those of you who ride helmets uh, are one of the preventative measures but then again i think that in a lot of countries you can just not take this preventative measure and if you're not taking a preventative measure i don't think it is a um, good sign or a good skill to have uh, if you're trying to build yourself uh, as a leader with a resilient capacity. If I'm talking about disaster, how many of you have experienced uh, one or the other disaster in your life? Is there anybody who has experienced a disaster in their lives on this call? It could be flood, living through flood, earthquake, industrial disaster, uh, some other disaster or accident. Uh, is there anybody who has lived through a disaster or identifies as somebody who has lived through a disaster uh, in their lives? Intense heat. Okay. Yeah, there is intense heat wave going on right now as well. Um, at least it is a very intensive uh, hot weather in India right now. So the heat wave is really bad in India. Earthquake, okay. And so with certain things, heat, if we know, so I'm talking about preventative measures. Okay, all right, flooding. So I'm gonna talk about preventative measures that if we are a leader, say we are mayor of the town, or if we are somebody who has that leadership capacity, how can we take preventative measures in that intense heat situation or an earthquake situation um, or in, in flooding areas? And then we can have a conversation about it later talk, and talk about if in your community, uh, people did take uh, preventative measures or not, or if your leaders ended up taking preventative measures or not. So if we know in, in, in a country or in a geography, if we know that it is going to be affected by a high heat range, for example, right now in India, it is 35 degrees and plus. It's actually 52 degrees right now in Delhi. Uh, so it's really hot. And, and we have been experiencing this um, around May and June and July since at least last 20, 25 years that we know of. And so if that is the case, and, and that if that is the summer case for India all the time, then there can definitely be a lot of precautionary measures to protect people from disasters. It could include making sure people don't go out during specific heat hours, people get enough hydration, that there is um, enough shade um, on in, in public areas, that there is enough water system in the public areas that are drinkable and, public and easily accessible to people. And so these are very common preventative measures that one can take in order to mitigate uh, or avoid shocks uh, or in you know, order to avoid stress that comes from uh, being in, in a stressful situation. Uh, for earthquake, uh, again, if your area is an area that suffers from a lot of earthquake, for example, in Japan, then your buildings can be constituted in a way and, and you as a leader can guide that change in your community in a way that are resilient to earthquake, that are not expensive, that don't brings that don't bring shock and disaster to the community if there's an earthquake. Uh, it doesn't bring a sense or a feeling of loss of infrastructure. And so in Japan, they use a very different quality, uh, a very different style uh, to bring, uh, to build houses than anywhere else in the world. They use light, um, wooden structured material. Um, they also practice a lot of minimalism in Japan so that if an earthquake comes, um, it is 
it brings minimal shock and stress to the community to it it causes least loss of life it causes least damage to infrastructure it causes the least money to build back up and so that's how then they strategize uh, and take preventative measures similarly with flooding as well um if if an area is prone to flooding then we can take certain measures now all of these examples that i've discussed are when i'm saying if we know that this is going to happen that means i'm talking about certainty in certain situation right we wear helmets while we are riding a bike or a motorcycle because we know if there is an injury to the head, it would be most serious and irreversible. And so we take that preventative measures in the certainty of knowing. But there are also, with and with climate change, of course, there are also a lot of uh, experiences or shocks or stress that can come with a lot of uncertainty and with a lot of unpredictability. And a resilient leader would know exactly how to respond even in the wake of those uncertainties. And so this is definitely um, a skill to have. And, and so if we're taking preventative measures in certainty to avoid minimum exposure and sensitivity, that is relatively easier to do if we are trying to minimize exposure and sensitivity to shocks and stresses that are unpredictable and uncertain, that is a more difficult thing to do. And in those situations, um, the leader, a resilient leader, would be forced uh, or compelled or would smartly look at situations resources and 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 measures that the leader can take to ex to avoid exposure or to minimize exposure and sensitivity to shocks and stresses and this is the second aspect of it which is appropriate coping strategies to avoid permanent and negative impacts should be taken in case of flood and earthquake, it could mean immediate rescue operation. It could also mean that, say, for example, if, if we are thinking of flooding, then the meteorological department can issue an early warning system saying there are signs of heavy rain and floods are likely to happen and therefore people should move to the shelters that are there to protect from floods. But the problem with a lot of global South countries is that this system does not exist. And it is, it is not just a problem of global South countries. If an event happens because it has never happened before, or that it did not happen in the last 50 or 100 years, it can be a very big problem in the Western countries as well. This is, I'm in Germany right now, and this is something that we saw in Germany in 2021. So in 2021, there were floods in Germany, and it was one of the most uncertain events that happened in Germany. And even though with all the resources, you know, all um, the financial resources, all, all the adaptive cap capacities, all the European resources that you know one can have, uh, one can benefit from. Um, there were a lot of leadership failures due to which um, the leader was not able to minimize exposure and sensitivity to the shocks and stresses. And in that situation, what then helped was the German community itself. And so a lot of Germans, a lot of uh, people who live around, they came together, they built a community, and they made sure that they were contributing enough to minimize 
and avoid permanent and negative impacts of this flood. And so people from all over the country in Germany went to that one particular area that was avoided by flood, uh, that was, uh, that most people would avoid because of floods, uh, but that was really destroyed by floods. Uh, but they put uh, as much community uh, energy into it in order to make sure that it uh, it grew back better. Now, why is resilient uh, capacity important? It is important because it ex equips leaders to handle uncertainty. It brings out emotional uh, stability of a person. It makes sure that the person is focusing on long-term sustainability and it fosters adaptive growth. Now, if you are a leader who is working in a group, and if you want, if you are somebody, if you're a leader who has or who wants to build resilient capacity, then you are automatically going to look into uh, uncertainties that you can think of. If you cannot think of uncertainties, and and once you think of uncertainties, you will you will be able to, you know, make a plan, plan A, plan B, plan C. Plan D then could be what happens in the most uncertain of situations. And so if you're somebody who has been in a group activity before or has led a group activity or has led a led an activity that, that wants to involve a lot of stakeholders or wants to bring a change for a lot of stakeholders, uh, then you would know to think of, of on these lines and to be able to be focused on that one object and purpose or goal that you're looking for. Now I want to play this video for you. Is it audible? Before I move forward, I would want somebody to unmute themselves and tell me if it is audible or not. It's not playing at the moment, so I can't tell whether it's audible or not. I'll play it again. All right, then. Today, I want to talk to you about how to lead through... Is it audible? Yes, it okay, is. Good. All right. ...through uncertainty as a leader. Now, let's take a look at this. If you haven't watched our previous 90SL on this topic, it comes from the U.S. military. They created this acronym, VUCA, right after the Cold War. It stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Now, it's important for us to be able to lead through change. It's crucial, in fact, that we do that when things are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous because we want to give our people courage. We want to give them a pathway forward. When something is volatile, we want to respond with vision. No one will follow a change if it happens too quickly or it seems so unpredictable that it doesn't fit. Cast vision for this change and promote the why before the what. Now, when something is uncertain, we want to respond with understanding. People fear the unknown. No matter how difficult that may seem to you as a leader, you have to acknowledge their uncertainty. You have to acknowledge their fear and listen to those concerns that they bring forward to you. Now, when something is complex, we want to provide clarity. If your purpose or vision is clear, then people will follow you even when things seem more complex or more uncertain. Clarity is a must. When something is ambiguous, we need to respond with agility. Now, that may sound like the previous thing, but it's a little bit different. Be willing to make changes on the fly in order to make things clear. If something is, again, too complex, we want to be agile enough to bring that clarity forward. Now that you understand how to respond to things that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, what are you going to do about it? All right, so this is 
Um, this is one of the videos that I wanted to play uh, to talk about uncertainty um, in situations um, and uncertainty for most actions that we take. Uh, okay. And so with that, I think I will end my uh, presentation here. I had another video that I wanted to play, but I think we can play that uh, once we initiate the conversation. And then I think th that'll help once we initiate the conversation instead of just me talking about it. All right. Thank you so much, Prof, for that presentation. So I want to um to confirm if you want to take questions from um the participant now. Yes, I am. I'm okay with taking questions right now, and also answer right. to my presentation uh, videos that have that I still have. All right. So uh, for those that have questions, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat so that um she will be able to address that before going forward. If you have any comment, any question that you want to be addressed, kindly raise your hand up and uh, we'll pick you up from there so that you can unmute your mic and ask it, or you can type it in the chat. You can also unmute yourself. I am happy to uh, answer questions. So um, at least we have enough time today. So if you have any question on the topic, the essence of building resilient capacity as a 21st century leader or as a leader, you can ask a question because um yesterday we struggled with time to uh, address all the questions so i think this is enough time for everyone to get to express uh, themselves and to get clarity on what you want to understand better yes okay. uh, go ahead daniel daniel go ahead First of all, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Did I pronounce your na name right? Yes, Danite. 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 Okay, go ahead. Uh, I am from Ethiopia. And I want to ask a question. On a leadership basis, sometimes the persons or the people who we lead will, will be very uh, resistant to things that we, we say or we try to pursue you and in this kind of situation, sometimes I lose hope and that's really hard for me. So is there any better strategy for resilience of this type? That was my oh, first yes. question. And the second, my second question is, as a female, have lots of responsibilities and being leader requires learning uh, so many times. So how can we manage? Do you have any suggestion about your schedule? I am a master's student and I'm struggling a lot. So I, I need your recommendation. All right. Uh, yes, I, as, as, as a female, I, I totally relate to the challenges that you said. It As a female, it becomes all the more difficult because uh, you don't have, you don't just have to deal with uh, challenges in a man's world that are very general challenges that can, that can come uh you also have to face challenges uh of being a leader um as as a female coming with a lot of responsibility from your work site so yes it is it is definitely very challenging uh but danite can i request you to tell me if there is any specific uh situation uh in your mind when you ask your first question um, because as a leader, I would think that if, if I'm having, if I'm forming a group 
or a team to say do a particular project say for example if i want to plant trees in my community uh, then i would first reach out to people who want to do that and so that is very important uh, to make sure a lot of like a lot of the work that you want to do with a particular object and purpose um, is is done. And so I think that first initial recruitment is also a very, very uh, important process. But say, for example, if you just come together with a group of friends and then, you know, you're trying to like uh, say some ideas and, you know, just put them out there and, and be a leader who's saying, you know, let's let's do this. We and in in that case, if you want to do that, your interests don't align, right? Uh, of the group that you're talking about. In in that situation, what I will suggest to you is then, a so if you try, is, yes, go ahead. I to make it clear, it's about it. It was with youth and. Uh, it's about so personal development and career enhancement, like that kind of things. But they, most of the people tell you that they really have an interest, but they will not express that one in, in their action. And yeah. they expect to every, every time to call them, to nag them, literally. It's called nagging. I don't know what to call it. Either. And that is really tire, tiring. And I feel like being stressed, being a very aggressive person, I, I, do, I really do not like to be like that. So most yeah. of the people say they want a change, but in their action, that's a whole different kind of story. So yeah, I, I, I personally sense. face that challenge a lot as well. And and I think in, in this case, uh, Danette, uh, if you've already gone through that first process of recruiting, and then if you're facing the challenge of, um, they still being disinterested after being saying that they were interested in it, um, then that is a more difficult thing to do. That is, you, you're, you're definitely facing a lot of challenge out there. And I have all the solidarity that I can uh, give to you right now because that is a more difficult situation to know that a person wants to do something, but the actions are completely different. Um, that can be very, very stressful. In that situation, do you think it might be good for you to perhaps, and, and I have a couple of ideas that I can give, would it be good for you to say, reduce down the, um, and I know it's it's so sad <laughs> that I have to tell a female leader that you have to reduce down some of your focuses and goals, uh, but I, I see that as a practical way to move forward. Would it be possible for you to say, reduce down the impact that you want to make in terms of numbers? To say, if you wanted to do it, but you wanted to reach out to 100 people, can you reduce it down to 10? Do you think that would be a good strategy? And if once you have formalized that, would then it be good enough to say, start doing it by your own self? So the idea is if you reduce the the, the qual quantitative impact of what you want to do as a matter of first step, and you take the first step and show some difference that you've made, maybe that can help bring in like-minded people or people who actually want to take action. Do you think that'll help? Yes, I think so. Reducing the number of the people. Even now from my experience, I try to change the target population and it has really lots of impact. By the way, yeah. it's a really great impact that I can put on people. That was really positive. Thing. But from yes. time to time, I become really burnt, burned out and disappointed. And I don't know sometimes what I'm feeling. So when I twisted things, I found that that was the main problem. But the teams, they have an amazing thing. We, we were able to create business partnerships and lots of big steps. 
But in order to make that one, I was suffering a lot. So that was my biggest problem. No, I, so I totally... I totally understand and relate to it. Uh, like I said, I face that on a regular basis, even in you know the smallest of things that I want to do. Um, and I think in that, and it's sad that um, females have to do it, female leaders have to do it more um, than uh, male leaders, but it is also a shocking reality of leading it uh, through as 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 a as a female uh, leader, um, I think a good practical uh, way uh, as a resilient leader would be to continue doing what you want to do because you know that is going to bring the change or the impact that you want to make. But also sometimes reduce down the paradigm of your project which makes it doable, like you don't have to depend on anyone. It's always good to delegate, uh, you know, responsibilities amongst your team if you're building it up. And, and, and once that happens, it becomes such an automatized system, right? Then you don't have to um, keep delegating information. But I think even in order to automatize it the way you want to, would require you to take some preliminary steps, which can be very, very small. If you want to make an impact, it could be just one thing that you do. That's it. And then from one thing, you can scale it up to two if you feel like uh, doing it. And then if you want to scale it up more, then maybe reach out to people. Uh, because sometimes if teams are uh, like-minded, it helps. If teams are not like-minded, perhaps some incentivizing would help them. And sometimes knowing that there is an impact, a positive impact coming can also work as an incentive to build up team. Thank you very much. All right, great. Um, hi, Victor, how are you? Hello, good evening from Nigeria. Yes, I would like to ask a question quite similar to the last one. Um, although for me, I'm a man. Um, and in relation to that question, I would like to know um, building resilience in a situation where we have people who are settling for probably their average, being a leader who uh, wants to develop a kind of resilient attitude, or you're working with people who are quite not necessarily not interested in doing their own jobs, or then um, they, they, they strive for excellence, which we want to develop as a leader. Um, the other group of people are not necessarily interested in pushing for such a um, level of excellence, setting for probably an average. How do you manage such a circumstance as a leader who wants to be resilient capacity? Thank you. Uh, Victor, can I repeat my understanding of your question? And then you could tell me if I've understood it right or not. All right. Okay. So what I've understood is that you want to know that sometimes as a resilient leader, it could be difficult to... Um, um, to to act according to the standard of excellence that is set by somebody. And it is always difficult to keep up with that standard. Uh, and how can one keep up with that standard of excellence or manage uh, that kind of standard of excellence? Is that the question? No, not exactly. Um, particularly, uh, I, I mean, uh, now being a leader, in the sense that you set the standard of excellence and you push through for it, you press on for the standard of excellence. For the team you are working with, for instance, it's not it's not really interested in, in pushing up for that kind of standard of excellence. They're ready to just settle for the average, get the job done, but there's no necessary um, desire for excellence. In them. How do you manage such an um, environment? How do you manage such a situation? 
All right. Okay, great. I, I understood your question. So you're right. If you are the leader of the team, you are setting the goal or the standard that you want to achieve. That is correct. And if if as a resilient leader, your, your goal is focused and you're like, this is what needs to be done, then you would definitely evaluate everybody with that standard of excellence. Now, the idea or understanding is that while you're doing that and if the team is not able to follow it up, in that situation, you should ask the team as to, number one, what do they need? Because you want that the team should be able to achieve this goal. So that is the first way to move forward. Once you ask them, what do they need? And they say, hey, this is what we need. Chances are you might have the resources or then you might not have the resources. And then, you know, you, you work your way out through it. But it is correct. You always set your own focus with the standard of excellence that you want to move forward with. Um, and worst case scenario, if you think you can, this is not the worst case scenario, but the second case situation could be in case you're feeling you're losing out on the goal or the focus that you have. Um, in In those situations, I think it would be important to change your strategy completely uh, and probably bring additional members of, in the team or additional uh, people who can help you achieve that goal. Uh, and, and in certain situations, it is okay to lower down the standard of excellence that you have set if you're able to achieve the general goal that you want to achieve as a leader. Uh, it may not be the, the perfectionist standard um, that you may or may not have set, but at least it it gives you that general impact that you were looking for. Do you have a follow-up, Victor? All right, looks like he does not. Is Zethro, if I've pronounced your name correctly. Zethro Lop Lopvus. Jeffro, you can unmute your mic and ask your question, please. All right, thank you. Okay, um, good evening. Hi. From where I am this evening now to Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jeffro. Um, first of all, I want to comment on your presentation on the goals and how some presentation. And thank you for sharing the slide with us. Uh, and I have a question which I have typed here on the chat. Uh, the question goes like, how can I manage to be a resilient leader in a challenging time, such as like I'm um, working in a team or an organization where you have opposition coming from your team members, from your bosses, from your mentors, while you, this idea, this thing you are pitching about, this thing you are talking about, is really what's affecting you personally and also the community that you come from. And then there's opposition strong opposition that could not make you feel to how can you stand or stand resilient in such a situation that is my question yeah right uh like it's i think this is very similar to the night situation wherein if you're working towards a common goal you're facing continuous opposition uh, from your team members and that can be very challenging and very harmful and very stressful as well uh, as you've already pointed out um, in that situation I think my overall uh, recommendations constitute the following or either of these number one is that um, could you again 
say, narrow down the object and purpose of what you're trying to achieve and say, narrow it down on one single goal and see if that goal is um, being achieved or not. And so if that goal is being achieved, then, you know, you can move on to the second most important goal of your um of your own uh, focus or goal. Why, why I suggest taking these steps first is if you're doing something and if you're facing opposition, uh, but if you're still continue, continuing to do it, there is certainly some impact because of some positive impact because of your, because of the actions that you're taking. And so might as well be good to evaluate if whatever steps you have taken, if there is a positive impact coming out of it or not. And then you can think of that positive impact first and think about how can you build out from that positive impact. Again, scaling it down probably or narrowing the focus down would be my first step, first recommendation. The second thing that you could do is that you could for, and once you've done that, you could go to your boss and say, you know, hi, boss. I think we are doing very good with this one impact. But I also highly think that we can do well in these four or five other impacts. But right now, the closest that we can achieve is probably this impact. And so while you have a, a very broad range of goals that you want to achieve through your project, once you have narrowed it down to one or two, and I know it's 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 not something that even when I am like trying to do things, I am never like, oh, okay, let's, you know, let's let's just focus on that one impact that I can make. Um, I I never want to do that as well. I never want to narrow down the yeah. focus of my project as well. But when I narrow it down to that one impact that I can make, it gives me more motivation and also helps me manage my stress in a better way because then I'm not feeling the loss through the work that I'm doing. Does that make sense? Any follow-up? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. Um, I think it's not. Thank you. All right. I think there is a question in the chat. The how can I be a resilient leader in an environment that I feel not accepted as well as unmotivated? That is such a difficult place to be in. Uh, but I think... Um, that is also the reality of um, how resilience in a leader in a leader is cultivated. Um, and again, I think taking one step at a time, one step in one day or one step in one month, if that is what is suitable to you as a leader, do that because, there's there's no golden thread or a straight jacket formula that I can give you that, you know, this is what it means to be a leader. No, that is not what I'm promoting. And I'm specifically not promoting, this is what it means to be a resilient leader. No, um, you definitely have uh, different capacities, different capabilities. You all come from very different backgrounds. You all are in a very different socioeconomic positions, very different demographics, very different geographies. So what is working out for me again might not work out for you. And, and that is why there has to be several different stories for becoming a resilient leader. And so I think as a matter of first step, uh, to be a resilient leader, you should find out what will give you motivation in such an opposing environment. Uh, for me, with my projects, generally the idea or motivation that guides me is, okay, I'm doing this. And then I ask myself, why am I doing this? And then I list down a trillion reasons as to why I want to do this. 
And while I while I do that, I I then ask myself, why am I not able to do this? Because and then I list down another quadruple zillion things or reasons why I'm I am not able to do this because I'm feeling unmotivated, unaccepted, I have so much opposition, I don't have resources, there's nobody supporting me. How am I how am I supposed to do it? And in that situation, I just boil it down to say the one or two reasons that I want to do it and that one or two resources or one or two persons who will support me through doing this. And as long as I internalize that for myself, I am internalizing resilience. And then I'm moving forward. So that's my answer to Petus. Okay, I think um that is um, the last question for now. So maybe you can proceed with some of the other videos and the other lessons that you wanted to share. Thank you so much for your answers. Yes, yeah, so the last, there's another question in the chat box. Mika asks, how can I position myself to become a leader especially in an African setting where elders are taken quiet as the more wise ones. Uh, Mika, I come from India and believe me, even in our community, elders are taken uh, the whatever elders say are taken much more in value than you know pe than people like me who's like really not that elderly right now i might be elderly in next 20 30 years but not right now um and and i come from a family where you know i've seen my great grandmother great grandfather um grand grandmother grandfather and then you know here i am and so india is also a community like that so it probably can relate to what you're saying. And and again, it's not easy. It's super difficult to be in that position where you always want to do things to make sure your elders feel respected and honored, but at the same time, you want to follow your dreams or follow what motivates you. And it's, it's definitely difficult. Um, and I think in those situations, what will help you is sometimes not rationalize with them. And so and so maybe, maybe you know, already do it and say, hey, this is the impact that I've done, I've made. This is a very positive impact and then share it with them. The other way could be to talk to them and try and understand if you can reach a middle point, but that'll be very difficult to do. Um, and third thing that you can do if you can do that is to ignore themselves completely <laughs> um and just to do what you want to do and i don't know I, I i don't want to say that there's anything wrong in it because um whatever they feel or believe their wiseness definitely comes from the experiences that they have had and the world that they have seen and and they've seen a lot. Like I'm sure they've they've been through they've they've known stories that we don't know. Um oh, we 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 still grow up in a very privileged environment as compared to theirs. Uh and so all of that stuff is there. But then also, you know, there are a lot of differences in, in the sense that how they see success. Is very, it could be very different from how you see success. If they see success as somebody who is uh, more educated and you see success as somebody who is more happy, then there's already an ideological difference over there. And so if there is a difference, then you need to really move forward in the direction which you think is more suitable for uh, your own goals and ideologies. Okay.
leader for ages. Um, Amika, do you mean leader for all, uh, you know, ages, meaning people with, or do you mean ages as a, as a temporal period across time? Across time. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question. Um, yeah, being relevant across time. I I definitely do not know how to answer this question. Um, I would, if, if I wanted to do that, maybe I will read people who have been leaders, read about people who've been leaders around the world. I would read books, writings of, about, for Nelson Mandela. I would read more about Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King. These are the people I would read. These were these were the resilient leaders, I think. Um, and I think people need more of those. Maya Angelou, uh, Greta Thunberg. Uh, probably these are the people I would uh, read more about because, yes, their teachings are more relevant across time. Uh, then uh, it is, but <laughs> yes, uh, but but I I think your comment also could be related to um, the teachings of the elderly and the wise uh, being relevant across time. I mean, sure, they are they they are probably most normal people in your community, but they could also have that. Um, knowledge which is valid across and relevant across time and if that is the case I don't even think you need to fight anybody if if you know this is the knowledge this is the experience that was relevant throughout the time that you know you know existed and will be relevant throughout the time that we know then then I think I think you need to go and ask those people <laughs> okay all right um Okay, I can then uh, continue with the presentation in that case. Okay, let's see. Emotional intelligence for leaders is critical if you want to build and maintain positive working relationships with people in your team. It allows you to understand others better so you can know what drives them or what keeps them engaged at work. It helps you to grasp team dynamics so you can reduce toxicity in your team. And emotional intelligence helps you to cultivate collaboration and creativity because people feel safe contributing at their optimal level. The World Economic Forum ranks emotional intelligence as one of the top skills needed to excel at work. Many established, experienced leaders have said that their success has been either constrained or amplified by their emotional intelligence. And many workers have said that they've left jobs because of a lack of emotional intelligence in their boss. At the end of the day, emotional intelligence is important in the workplace and it's incredibly important in leadership. We've established that. So let's backtrack a little and look at what emotional intelligence is exactly. Emotional intelligence is most often defined as the ability to perceive, use, understand, manage, and handle emotions. Psychologist Daniel Goleman, the guru on emotional intelligence, says that it's our capacity to be aware of, to control, and to express emotions. Whichever definition you look at, emotional intelligence seems a little bit cryptic. On the surface, you might think that, yeah, I have emotional intelligence. I can understand my own emotions. I understand other people's emotions. But do you? Because when you dig a little bit deeper, you start to realize that there's a lot more to developing emotional intelligence than you think. I'm Kara Ronan, leadership coach to emerging leaders. And on this channel, I share videos every week to help you in your leadership journey on how to build leadership skill, improve your communication skill, and how to be more visible at work. Subscribe to my channel below if you want more content like this every week. The very first place you need to start when you're developing emotional intelligence is with yourself. You need to understand your own emotions and you need to be more self-aware. However, not a lot of people can genuinely do this. Research in the Harvard Business Review 
review shows that 95% of us think that we are self-aware, but only 10 to 15% of us are actually self-aware. So there's this overestimation when it comes to self-awareness, and this can translate into an overestimation about our ability to be emotionally intelligent as well. To help you avoid this, I'm going to share with you an activity that will help you to become more self-aware about your emotions and help you to build emotional intelligence too. This activity is a reflection activity that requires you to think about your interactions with others at work and to identify triggers for different emotions that you might feel. On the screen, you'll see one side that says positive emotions and the other side that says negative emotions. Most of the emotions we feel can be categorized into either positive or negative emotions. For positive emotions, I want you to think about your interactions at work and answer these questions. What are your calm triggers? So what events or situations make you calm? What are your happy triggers? So what events or situations make you happy? What are your fulfillment triggers? So what events or situations make you feel fulfilled? So reflect on your past week at work and your interactions with other people at work and try to identify triggers for each of these positive emotional states. Then you're going to do the exact same thing for negative emotional states. For negative emotions, think about your interactions at work and answer these questions. What are your stress triggers? So what events or situations make you stressed? What are your anger triggers? So what events or situations make you angry? What are your frustration triggers? So what events or situations make you feel frustrated? Through this simple activity, you should have a deeper insight into your own emotions and a deeper awareness and understanding about yourself. This is the very first step in developing emotional intelligence. Let me know in the comments if this activity was helpful for you. Once you have more self-awareness, then you can move on to understanding other people's emotions. Now, this is a little harder to achieve because from the outside, it's very difficult to truly understand how another person feels. You might try to interpret interpret their emotions from the external cues that they show you, like their verbal communication or their nonverbal communication. But the reality is, especially in the workplace, people will show you what they want you to see. So because of this filtering process that goes on, it's very difficult as a leader to truly understand the emotions of someone else. But all is not lost. There are some things you can do to try to understand other people's emotions as best you can. I recommend a three-step process. First, start by observing people either individually or as a group. Yeah, you're still getting cues only from external actions or behavior. You're still facing a filter where people might not act or behave in an emotionally revealing or in an emotionally honest way. But you've got to start somewhere. So begin by observing. Pick a situation or an event at work, for example, a meeting, and start to observe the people in that group. As you're observing, ask yourself this question. Do people display positive or negative emotions overall. This will help you categorize their emotions into positive or negative. If there are mainly positive emotions on display, then which is the overarching positive emotion? If there are mainly negative emotions on display, what is the overarching negative emotion? It could be one of the emotions we talked about in the previous point, or it could be another emotion that you detect. Second, once you have elevated your skill in reading people, then you need to move on to the next step, which is listening. And the key here is to listen with the intention to understand, which means you have to listen without judgment. Judgment clouds our ability to accurately read people or to understand their emotions. It's like a block or a barrier that distorts the way that we see things. If you're truly committed to developing emotional intelligence as a leader, then you need to make sure that you leave judgment at the door. There are a number of opportunities for leaders to listen during one-on-one -on -one meetings. This is a great opportunity for you to listen to your employees as a leader. As they talk, you can listen to identify what are their problems, what are their struggles, what have they tried as a solution, what didn't work, what did work, and why didn't it work. Group meetings are another fantastic opportunity for you to listen. As people talk and interact during the group meeting, you can listen to individual team members to really understand what they're saying, and you can read their external cues to further understand 
their emotions and what they're feeling. If you have any other ideas of opportunities where leaders can listen, write them in the comments below. The third thing you can do to understand someone else's emotions is to ask. So once you have observed them, once you've listened to them, if you still want to know how they're feeling, simply ask them. How do you feel about the progress on this project? How did it make you feel when David took credit for your work? How do you prefer to contribute in meetings? Do you want to contribute in a spontaneous way or do you want time to prepare? In the majority of cases, your team members will feel heard, understood and appreciated simply because you ask them how they feel about something. We've covered understanding your own emotions, understanding other people's emotions. Next, you need to know how to react accordingly. And this specifically focuses on managing and handling emotions as mentioned in the Wikipedia definition of emotional intelligence. What this really means is to be aware of your own emotions, to recognize other people's emotions so you can respond in an appropriate way. Leaders who do respond appropriately build stronger bonds with people in their team, leading to higher levels of job satisfaction, contribution and engagement at work. Leaders who do not not respond appropriately, create fractures in their team, leading to dissatisfaction, low or minimal contribution, and very little engagement. I think you can guess which type of leader is more successful in their career and has a better reputation at work, right? For you to react accordingly, to be a successful leader and one with high emotional intelligence, it does depend on the specific situation and the people you are with. However, there are some guidelines or some tips that you can follow. Develop a person-focused leadership. So this means to build good relationships with people in your team, build trust with them, and show genuine concern for them. Be empathetic, which means to identify the thoughts, the attitudes, and the emotions of another person, basically putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Acknowledge contributions. So whenever people share a good idea, tell them. Address fallbacks or failures in a curious and an empathetic way. So instead of attacking or belittling that person who made the mistake, try to understand why they made the mistake and how it can be fixed in the future. Make sure nobody feels excluded from the group. So work on developing psychological safety with your team and make sure everybody knows the value that they contribute. Understand and address conflict immediately. Don't ignore it and certainly don't pretend it's not your job. Admit when you're wrong. Leaders can be wrong. Don't try to cover it up or to blame it on someone else. Use genuine body language to appear authentic. I recommend that you use charismatic body language like I talk about in this video up here. Thank you so much for watching this video about building emotional intelligence for leaders. I hope you got a lot of valuable tips and insights so you can apply it to your leadership journey. All right. I hope that this actually answers some of the questions that were raised um, a little bit uh, ago in our conversations here. If there is any other question following this particular video, um, then I'm happy to take those. And so the idea of showing this video was that a lot of opposition from your own team uh, which is in fact, which can in fact come out as a fracture to uh, your team can be avoided if uh, if emotional intelligence is integrated in the uh, leadership skills. Olayinka, uh, please go ahead. Ola Inka, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, my question is when you study people, try to relate with their emotion and try to be considerate with them. How do you avoid them being, you know, taking advantage of you emotionally or blackmailing you emotionally? They know that yes, you're actually being considerate about them. Because you can do that just to like get away or just to take advantage of you. So that's my question. Um, yes, yes, you're right. It is again not not easy to be able to do that. Uh, because if you're trying to achieve emotional bonding with other people, then you are 
you're also putting yourself out there you're exposing yourself and you're also vulnerable so yes but i i think the idea is not to make yourself vulnerable and not to expose yourself but still uh, be uh, emotionally connected with those people and I think if you want to do that there are there are certain boundaries that you can have for yourself while you're building an emotional relationship uh, because if you have boundary then you will build an emotional relationship smartly uh, and you know these are the kind of questions that you can answer while doing this uh, questions can be while I'm building this emotional connection, uh, what do I want to achieve out of it? If I'm building this emotional connection, how can I, uh, you know, what should I do in order to protect my own self or like my own emotional uh, integrity uh, while, while I'm doing this? And, and yes, and so, you know, being emotional intelligence definitely means building emotional, healthy emotional relationships. And, and what you're saying to me is that uh, you want to avoid somebody to take benefit um, out of this emotional relationship that you've built from you. If that is happening, it is not a healthy uh, or a smart emotional relationship. It is not emotional intelligence uh, on your behalf or on the behalf of the person who you are engaged with. And in that sense, it is important to reevaluate um, the priorities and then, you know, say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to achieve. Um, and, I, and I don't want to be exploited. Uh, and, and so while it is easy to say that, it is all the more difficult to do it. Uh, but yes, those are, those are some actions that you can take. I hope that helps. So Mika asks, um, Bethos, I will share uh, the link to that video in, in some time. Mika asks, it's quite hard to strike a balance. Uh, how well can a leader strike a balance between relating with his teammates and being respected? Uh, Mika, uh, I will give you I, an answer that might not be very mainstream. Uh, it might be very unconventional uh, standard uh, of answering this question. And so when you say being respected, I think the whole idea or understanding is what is your own standard of being respected? And, and, and there could be various standards um, that you want to be respected as uh, in, in a team, right? I uh, have known, uh, like I have worked in a lot of variety and diverse teams. And there was this one particular team that I was working on uh, in which, you know, if there is a senior, I needed to uh, address that senior with a prefix, say, Mr., Sir, uh, so-and-so, and or, you know, Mrs., madam so and so and so I, I could not speak to them if that was not there and 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 I and I did that right uh, to be a part of the team but not all people will do that uh, then there is I've also worked in teams where it was okay to call the person by their first name uh, and um, not use their prefixes but even even with that kind of liberty, there there were some people who would you know still give respect to that person by adding certain prefix, um, but still go behind his back and you know went went it out um, or or talk things that they don't like about this person. Now, when you're working in the team, it is really really important to identify that what do you want uh, out of uh, the the work that you're doing, the project that you're doing, is it you know what is what is the level of respect that you want? Um, and you you can be honest about it. You can share rules and regulations about it. But even if it's not working out, would you uh, choose to 
do away with a person who is helping you a lot achieve that one goal that you want to do as as a as a resilient leader or because that person is not emotionally intelligent because that person cannot follow your standard of being respected would you let him or her go uh, which is highly likely to impact uh, your overall goal that you're achieving as well so these are the questions that you can address when you're trying to strike a balance uh, because what are you balancing really is your prerogative. Um, as, as a leader, you decide, oh, I'm trying to balance this with this. I'm trying to balance respect with um, relationship between my teammates. I'm trying to balance respect with uh, overall uh, goals um, of it. And, and if you're trying to balance between relating with the teammates and being respected, um, then, you know, that's that's something that you need to decide. Uh, in that balance, is there an hierarchy? So th that is the first question you will answer. If you're trying to balance being respected and maintaining the relationship that uh, you have with the teammates, then is there anything which is more important? If it is, then you definitely choose it. If there is... If for you both are equal, then you answer other questions as to, you know, why is it equal? Is it because the kind of work that you're trying to do? Um, no, why why they are both important, and why do you want to hold them together? And then what are the steps that you can take in the situation that you are? Um, this is this is what I'll do. Uh, but yes, um, that's Mika, right? Does the uh, if you have any other question, just let me know. Uh, then Betas asks, how do you handle the situation of wanting to help someone having emotional issue and they seem to not be ready to cooperate? It's a very difficult question again, Betas. Um, it is not easy to help someone who has an emotional issue. Because when you're saying that somebody has an emotional issue, probably they need some external help that I, as an individual, is not trained enough to provide for others' emotional issues, which could be which could be wide ranging, right? I I'm not professionally um, trained to do that, and so in those situations. Um, I wouldn't try to resolve them for them. I can only try to keep an emotional maturity in that situation for myself. And so if I'm thinking somebody has an emotional issue, um, say, for example, if somebody has an anger trigger, because, you know, say usage of a certain word can bring in anger in a lot of people. If I know that somebody is getting an issue, getting triggered by the usage of that word, it, and the usage of that word is the usage by me or any other teammate, then what I can do is try to avoid using that word and trying to prevent um, other teammates to avoid using that word if it is that small of an issue. But if it is a bigger issue wherein somebody is you know, trying to really put their emotional issues to destroy the complete bonding between teammates or to affect the overall relationship that we have with them, then in that situation, um, you know, you could recommend some professional help for those uh, people. But it, but even then, it's not going to be easy. Uh, cooperation should come from conversation and the ability to communicate. And so interpersonal communication 
is very important. Um, and even if you're trying to make sure that you cooperate or collaborate, it should not be seen as something that was forced upon. And so uh, cooperation should always feel like, hey, what do you want to do? Hey, what do you want to do? But I cannot do that. Um, this is what I can do. And so really reaching to a middle ground, which is widely accepted by most people in those situations also keeping to the core the object and purpose of what you're trying to do out of it or what you're trying to achieve out of it all right i will then Emotional. play another video that i have all right. skills that we look for in our leaders, but certainly one of the of the skills is the ability to manage. A second one is the uh, the ability to lead and to inspire other people. Uh, but well, the third one well, that we can only hear the, the speech. You can see the video. Yeah, we can see the video, but we can only hear the speech. You cannot hear it. We are hearing the speech, but we can't unsee. Oh, so. okay. Okay. All right. Let me. Uh... Uh, Francis, do you think you can share your screen and try to, uh, oh, okay, I haven't shared the screen. All right, sorry. <laughs> can you see the screen now? Yes. Well, there are a number of skills that we look for in our leaders, but certainly one of the of the skills is the ability to manage. A second one is the uh, the ability to lead and to inspire other people. Uh, but the third one that often is overlooked is the ability to communicate. You need to have uh, courage. You need to have, I think, uh, a long term political commitment and social commitment. And thirdly, you need to have faith in the vision that you have for that change. Well, uh, for me, um, it's the three L's and in this order. First of all, being able to listen before you talk and tell other people, listening with a menu about uh, what people might like to do in sustainability. Secondly, is to link together what people say. And if you do those two steps, you'll get a unified willingness to engage in the third step, which is to lead people to learn how to do the changes that they've now endorsed. I think one of the most important skills for someone to be an effective leader in sustainability is the ability to listen. Uh, that followed by the ability to tell their own story, their own experiences, in a way that's that's colorful and explicit and clear to the audience. Yeah, I think that they are very, very basic skills, like being able to listen, you know, um, Caring, caring skills, being able to work with people, you know, togetherness. They are basic, simple skills that we learn from nature. Those are the most um, important skills, you know, for sustainability. I think the single most important skill is having passion and commitment. Uh, but it's, it's enthusiasm is contagious. But when people see someone who really cares about something, they're always impressed. They're always engaged. So that, that's skill number one. And the skill number two is uh, to, to really understand how people think and to understand where they're coming from, uh, to really be a compassionate listener and to try to meet them where they are. I think most importantly, leaders need to listen. Uh, they then need to link ideas, um, need to link energies. And they need, then need to provide direction, building on those energies and ideas. 
there's there's a, a lot of people who who really are looking for for leaders to provide solid direction but what they're really needing is a way of co-energizing and bringing together uh, of different worldviews and and possibilities and after that i'm going to play the last video that i have for this presentation oh sorry yeah. We always talk about being a stable company and we talk about investing in stable companies and you know are you are you stable and you think about stability stability is is an immobile object <laughs> you know uh and and so uh companies that are built for stability yes they're able to weather storms but they don't come out stronger or better they just come out they get through building a company for resilience means that you go into darkness, but you're actually able to adapt for new times, new technologies, new cultures, new politics, new tastes. And you come actually out of the hard times stronger than you went in. Um, Victorinox is a great example. Victorinox, many of us know them by their signature product, which is the old Swiss army knife. And this company made basically made a name for themselves on this basically one line of product. They had other product, but this was this was the core. And then something happened that they couldn't predict, nor could they uh, prepare for, which is September 11th happened. And overnight, we were banned from taking their product in our bags, in our hand luggage or in our pockets. We So many of us used to carry a Swiss army knife in our pockets or just throw one in our hand luggage. Like we all had one. You know, every birthday for every teenager, they got at least one, right? Um, every corporate gift, you, you had a couple of Swiss Army knives, and now we were banned from carrying them, which means you're less likely to buy one to give as a gift. And so their business, their business plummeted overnight through no fault of their own, through no market conditions, nothing predictable. But the genius of Victorinox <clears throat> is that they were built for resilience. And what they did was they, in good times, instead of giving away all the money in big bonuses, in good times, they actually saved a ton of money. And their attitude was, um, good times don't last, but neither do bad times. And if we want to get through bad times, we need to have, we need, we need cash. And so instead of panicking and taking loans or whatever it is, they had their own stack of cash that, it, that they'd been hoarding. So they had a, a little financial resilience. But then they um, uh, looked at other products and they asked their people to help build up. And they started investing heavily in watches. Now we have Victorinox watches, which are much more, and it's still Swiss made. Everything that they could do, everything that they knew how to do, clothing, um, everything, they leveraged their brand heavily and they built it back up. Um, also, they protected all of their people. They actually made deals with companies prior that if, it, if bad times ever happened, that, that other companies would borrow their employees, which I thought was genius. They didn't lose their jobs. They just did their jobs somewhere else. Um, and they completely reinvented their company. Company Now, to this day, their Swiss Army knife never really recovered. It came up back a bit, but it's now not the major product. It's a minor product that they sell because they actually came out stronger and reinvented. Um, and to be able to do that, think about that. Coming in as one kind of company and coming out of as, as another kind of company, very, very rare and very, very special, but very infinite-minded. All right, that is from my side. Um, that is all I have to uh, share uh, in terms of, you know, the skills that you need and the skills that you can develop. Okay, thank you so much. On behalf of Impressions Fans and Foundation, I would say that we are grateful for your time, for the wonderful presentation. So, um. I kindly react in the chat to um to appreciate our wonderful speaker for this presentation. You can type your words of appreciation in the chat or you can react through um emojis to uh, give a resounding um, applause to our facilitator for the wonderful session because it's been insightful, especially uh for the fact that she infused them some videos. It's just like you are watching television or you are watching movies and you are learning at the same time. So it is actually very, very fun. And that was something interesting. For those who were here last year, I feel like um, she just um, did something similar to what we we saw from Professor Badab, who is also from India. So um, and probably I can say that and 
we have good teachers from India that we can learn from because their style is something understandable. And for giving us the time to ask a lot of questions as well, it was so insightful and we had time to interact and to address your specific needs. So we are very grateful to you, Ma. We appreciate. And uh, there are some questions that were asked about um, the video. So um, I will try to get in contact with you to see if we can have the links to the videos to share to the participants so that they can watch them after the session. And also, they often ask about the slides. So I want to know if uh, the slides will be available to share to them as well, because um, it's going to be a point of reference for them to, to go back and um, to refresh those points that um, they learned today. Yes, so All I right. will uh, share the link. Um, you know, I will share the slide with you, and I think that should be enough to um, just for the videos and everything. All right, that is great. I can even see some some comments. Someone says that uh, they want to study in India now. Wow, that is great. That is great. Okay. Super grateful for your, all of your appreciation. And thank you, Francis and Christian, for allowing me to uh, do this and allowing me to make this very tiny little impact that I can. Um, and so thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. So uh, before I'll call on... Uh, and I'll to, uh, to say one or two things that he may have to say. Uh, kindly take note that um, attendance is still compulsory because we need you here. And um, we don't just want to give you a certificate, but we want you to get the real impact to learn and understand and be able to apply that knowledge. So that is why the uh, training is being structured in such a way that the topics, they are being built on one, one after another. So you have to be able to learn and from the first day to the second day to be able to understand everything that is going on. So for tomorrow, we're going to be having someone very special. Um, tomorrow is going to mark um, his third year as a facilitator for this training. So you can imagine what that is going to be because he has been here since 2022, yeah, 2022. So he has been here for, um, for the past year. So tomorrow, just get ready to learn from him because um, um, he's going to bring his his experience as a facilitator of this bootcamp and um, other life experiences as well. So I will advise you to try as much as possible to get your gadget ready and to join tomorrow's session. So uh, before the final words, we'd like to hear from the president of Precious Fountain Foundation, Mr. Christian Soprochu, if he has any words to give for the day. Thank you so much, um, Chaya and Francis, for this session. Uh, I would say that I really benefited a lot from this. And um, make sure you're here tomorrow. Jeff has been a regular on this event for the past three years. You will learn a lot from him. I also learned a lot from him. So looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Uncle Sob. So um, finally, uh, and try to check your emails tomorrow because I'll be sending the link to the meeting as well. And for those who are here to join the WhatsApp group, you can check your emails and then click on the link that is provided there so that you can join the group. And from there, uh, we share an update about the session and the link as well. So you can do that to keep a date with us. And uh, if you want to know more about Precious Fountain Foundation, I'll be sharing... um our social media handles to the WhatsApp group so that you can get to follow us and get an update on our event. And for those that may want to join us to work with us, um, you can follow us, especially on our website. There is everything there that you need. It's a very simple process. And just go to Precious Fountain Foundation. Just type it on your device, whether it's a mobile phone or laptop or wherever, and you can just go to our website and, and read more about us. So from there, we will get to see you or to meet you. So with that, we have come to the end of today's session. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow because it's going to be um, another insightful and enlightening session. So thank you very much for being with us from the beginning to the end of this session. I really appreciate your time. Thank you all and goodbye for today.